Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. We apologize for the uh, late start of the press conference. I know many of you prefer uh, earlier press conferences during the day for obvious reasons, so we'll try to be uh, to the point and get you out of here uh, promptly. Joining me today is our uh, tremendous commissioner of the Department of Transportation in Minnesota. Uh, we are very grateful for his uh, leadership and service, Tom Sorrell. Uh, we also have the program manager and fixer and uh, all things uh, <laughs> Uh, enabler of various projects and needs and services at the Department of Transportation, John Chiglo, and then the Chief Stimulation Officer, or CSO, <laughs> for the state of Minnesota, Tom Hansen, otherwise known as our Finance Commissioner, and we have other names for him too, not appropriate for public uh, release or discussion. Uh, we're here today to announce the unveiling of a portion of the federal stimulus uh, funds and our plans and intentions for uh, using those funds as quickly and effectively as possible. As I think all of you know, I uh, was uh, in favor of a stimulus bill for our country, but I thought the one that passed could have been done uh, much better. I was hopeful that it would focus on things that would get uh, cash into the pockets of individuals rather than government systems and institutions, but also strongly favored uh, bread and butter infrastructure projects like roads and bridges. Uh, overall, we're glad to make this announcement today, but we note it is disappointing that the bill only includes out of $800 billion, $27 billion uh, for roads and bridges, uh, unfortunately. But we want to make uh, the best use of that money as possible, even though it is a relatively small a part of the bill. And of course, the state of Minnesota, even though it's federal money, has the responsibility uh, to decide which projects are selected, articulate the criteria for those projects, be accountable for the construction of the projects, and be accountable for making sure that the return on investment is what we all hope for uh, going into the uh, the construction season. I want to be clear, though, that the announcements we're making today are not uh, the extent of the transportation initiatives for the state of Minnesota this year. You, many of you know that each spring we have an annual announcement around the construction season that highlights the construction commitments for roads and bridges across Minnesota. What we're announcing today is in addition to that announcement, which will be coming up in the next few weeks in March. So this is on top of the normal uh, construction or regular construction that otherwise would have taken place. And as the commissioner will mention in just a moment, that in fact was one of the criteria that the federal government required for use of this money, which is you couldn't just use it for something that would have been done anyhow in 2009 as part of your normal construction season. So we had to bring forward uh, projects from uh, beyond that season or, or cycle uh, to accelerate into this project or into this uh, set of activities. Uh, the estimates are that this will save or create approximately 5,000 jobs in the state of Minnesota. The portion that we're focused on today is the greater Minnesota portion of it. It's approximately $180 million in total. About $8 million of that will be local money uh, that will be contributed, but the vast majority of it is part of the stimulus uh, pool of, of monies. Uh, this is just the greater Minnesota portion. In a few weeks, we'll be announcing the metro portion. We're continuing to work on the criteria and possibilities and opportunities within the metro area, but that will also be approximately $180 million in activity, so there's a 50-50 split between the metro area and greater Minnesota, and uh, we know that that kind of balance is important, and uh, we want to try to achieve that uh, through these funds as through our normal uh, distribution of funds as well. I also would like to just uh, note that the projects, I won't go through them all, but they are many. The commissioner will talk about the need to have a mix of projects because the construction industry in Minnesota is varied. So we have uh, in this package some original construction, some repaving, some safety items like guardrails and some other things. And again, that was one of the criteria in the bill is to try to, uh, and our, one of our goals is to try to get a mix of projects so a mix of contractors uh, could participate in the benefits uh, of the bill. Uh, in general, you'll see them spread out over the state, and uh, I think I'll turn it over to the commissioner to talk about the criteria uh, that were used to select these projects. Just because something is here, uh, or excuse me, not here, doesn't mean it won't appear in the regular construction schedule now or in the future. The criteria that were used to select these projects were such that it required us to focus in and narrow in on certain types of projects, not because other projects weren't generally meritorious, they just didn't fit the criteria of the federal bill. So with that, sure. Commissioner Sorrell. Thank you, Governor. Uh, what I, what I want to do uh, is just talk a little bit about uh, how we got here today and how we've been preparing at MnDOT for this day to, to unveil these projects to you all. 
You know, when we, when we knew that economic stimulus was uh, becoming a reality, we took a lot of time to prepare ourselves, and, and I think that's a large part of our success. We, we, we knew we had to look at our processes, we had to have our people in place to deliver this program, and we had to work very closely with our external stakeholders and our partners, the federal agencies, the state agencies. So we, uh, early on in the process, we worked very, very hard to develop those, those partnerships, and, and that's what we did. And uh, I know early on there was a propensity for people to want to know what projects were going to be included in this package and uh, what kind of program it would look like. But we resisted that because we felt, again, it was important to develop the processes and the partnerships we needed to deliver the program. And then ultimately we knew we would come up with the right projects, the right projects for the citizens of our state. In developing these projects, we, uh, we, we, again, we focused on the, proce on the process, but one of the key moves we made early on was to recognize we needed a focal point in the department to deliver this program. And uh, we appointed John Chiglow, who was finishing up his work on the I-35W bridge as the project manager there. We brought John in to be our program manager for delivering this program. And that was a pretty significant move for us because, uh, you know, we were having a lot of separate discussions within the department. We needed to pull it together in a cohesive way, and John has done that. He's, I think he's pretty uniquely qualified to do this. He's got a lot of great experience on the bridge and projects before that, and he's got a lot of experience in innovative processes and streamlining procedures and innovative contracting that he's utilizing to deliver this program. So that's a pretty significant accomplishment for us, and we're very proud to have John delivering this program for us. We, early on, we also established some guiding principles for this program, and, and they, uh, they clearly mesh with the principles that were established for the recovery program when it was ultimately unveiled. But the pr principles we used to develop our program, first and foremost, del uh, focused on deliverable projects. There's a lot of projects out there that would be good economic stimulus projects, but not all are deliverable in the time frames that were established by this program. So we focused on projects that were deliverable in the time frames that we were presented. The second thing we focused on is, is a consistency in our programming practices. We wanted to make sure that we were true to MnDOT programming practices and the projects that we selected came from existing plans or, or, or statewide implementation programs or STIPs, statewide transportation improvement programs. We wanted to make sure that the projects that we move forward with were included in some type of programming or planning practice, and we wanted to stay true to that, and we have. The third uh, principle that we utilized to develop this program was to have a statewide representation of projects, and the, government, the governor alluded to that, and if you look on this map, I think you see that. We felt it was very, very important to have our projects distributed around the state to stimulate job growth. And the last piece that was very important to us is to have a balance of work type in this program. In other words, we didn't want to just have a bunch of asphalt overlays out there. We wanted to have a balanced program of different kinds of work that we could put out there to help maintain um, um, a healthy industry to deliver these projects. We felt that was an important part of the package and, and it was in, within the spirit of what was presented to us. Now we've done a lot of outreach to get where we're at today. We've done a lot of outreach with our industry, and that was an important piece of this, uh, working with our consultants and our contractors. The question always comes up, do we have the capacity to deliver this program? We feel we do, and the reason we feel that way is because we work very closely with our partners in the industry, and uh, we work together to make this uh, re a reality. So we're very confident that we have the capacity to deliver. I'll also say, as we developed and designed this program, we also are trying to position ourselves should there be a redistribution of money sometime down, down the road. There's a high possibility that that could happen if other states can't utilize their stimulus dollars. Uh, they could be redistributed to other states who are positioned properly, and that, that is a, a, con, um, um, a, a principle we adopted as well, that we could be in a position, should additional money become available, that we'd be in a position to take advantage of that as well. Now, the program we unveiled today, as the governor said, is a Greater Minnesota program. We have uh, in that program, there are five projects of $10 million or more, and I'd just like to highlight a few of them. Uh, in St. Louis County, we have Trunk Highway 53, which is a, an $18 million project. That's the largest project on this list. 
We have a project in Freeborn County, uh, um, Trunk Highway 90. It's an overlay project, uh, $14 million, a large project. And our third largest project on the list was in Chippewa County. It's an unbonded concrete overlay for in, a, in the area of $14 million. Now, there's some other interesting projects on this list of lesser value, but very important to us as a community. We have a project in St. Peter that I think uh, is an important project. It runs through historic St. Peter. It's a challenge from a historical perspective, but in the end, I think it can be a case model, case study for us on how to do these projects under those circumstances. The other interesting project on this list is in Chisholm, where we have a subsidence issue, and what I mean by that is the, there's, there, the ground is collapsing in certain areas uh, around the highway there uh, because of taconite mines, abandoned taconite mines, and we've got to come up with a solution to, to build a strong structural roadway over those those abandoned mines, and, and we've included that in this package as well, and that's an interesting project as well. So with that, I, I just want to reassure you that we are prepared to deliver. I feel very, very confident that in the end, the program that we propose to you here today will serve the, uh, the safety and our, our, the mobility of our citizens very, very well. I'm very confident that uh, we at Minda are going to deliver, so Great, thanks thank so you. Much. And then I think in the interest of time, we'll just have uh, Tom and uh, John be available for questions. Also, I should introduce Kevin Gutnick, who I think all of you know, but uh, he is one of the key uh, question answers at the Department of Transportation. So if you have follow-on questions or need for information, Kevin is uh, somebody who's able to help you as well. Uh, obviously, the unemployment situation nationally and in Minnesota continues to deteriorate. Uh, most experts expect the unemployment rate nationally to continue to climb closer to 10 percent. The same will be true. Uh, in Minnesota, uh, but as that happens, we want to do all that we can to get people reemployed and employed as much as possible to try to slow that down and also begin to reverse it. This will be an important uh, help, won't be obviously the only thing that needs to happen, but it is one important step to try to get more Minnesotans employed or to keep their jobs, uh, and so we believe this will be quite helpful uh, in that regard. We'll be happy to take your questions. You said 5,000 jobs. <laughs> well, Donnie, with all these figures, first of all, there's various groups who put out various projections, and they're oftentimes different, so you've got to put it in a little bit of context. Secondly, there is a phenomena where many contractors have said, uh, if we didn't get something like this, uh, we'd have people laid off, or we do have laid, be, people laid off, so they're being called back, or they were at risk of being laid off. So. I don't know if you want to be more uh, precise about it, Commissioner, but in general, it's 5,000 jobs created or saved. I think there's a lot of contractors saying, but for this project, we wouldn't be able to call back this season some or all of our employees. So um, and, and they're not new jobs in all cases. They're sometimes using people who would otherwise have been, employing people who otherwise would have been laid off or not called back. Governor, it's really like that's a Federal Highway Administration estimate. That's yeah. not our estimate. Yeah. You get different depending on whether it's the White House, the the transportation department, various interest groups, stakeholder groups, the kind of the job numbers, there's a range of what they project. What kind of uh, compromises have you had to make uh, regarding projects that might have been um, you know, uh, better, better choices but were not you know, mm. shovel ready? Anyway? Yeah. Well, I'll give you some examples, Pat, and maybe the commissioner, John, please jump in. Um, you know, the criteria here are pretty tight, and so we had to move past some projects that were quite desirable or meritorious. That's not to say these aren't, but to, the others wouldn't qualify. For example, there's continuing concern uh, in southern Minnesota in the Mankato area uh, around Highway 14. So you have a remaining segment there from Owatonna to Dodge uh, mm -hmm. Center, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good project, and it's just finishing up its environmental review and the process around the environmental review, but it's not quite out of that yet, and so it wasn't ripe for this money. Now, it might, might be, or would have been, maybe just a bit down the road, but it's not at the moment, so we had to look over or move beyond that project for purposes of using this money, and there are other examples of that, too. Commissioner, you want to add any no, more? Is no, that correct? that's fine. Okay. Uh, well, that's a, I think in, as a general rule in the state of Minnesota, federal money that comes in, and Tom, maybe you want to step forward, uh, unlike some other states, we, the, the legislature has to appropriate money, so we're authorized to spend it. Um, but Tom, do you know more precisely as to this money, whether that applies? 
we're required to have the legislature um, appropriate the funds and the governor sign the, the appropriation authority. Um, typically in Minnesota, um, the, the highway transportation projects aren't specifically spelled out in legislation. So we usually appropriate a general amount um, and general language and then MnDOT through their expertise um, um, picks, the, and, um, picks the projects through a consensus process. Typically, um, they have not, but if they want to statutorily, I don't think there's, no, there's nothing in the Constitution that would forbid them from doing that. Do they have to approve this by March 13th? No, we have to do some, the initial authorizations, I think, by the 13th. We, time we, we, right. We, we have a, our first letting is scheduled for March 13th. We've av actually advertised some of these jobs already um, in anticipation of the letting on March 13th. And, and um, I want to kind of highlight that, that these projects that we, you're seeing here today, they have gone through a collaborative process to get to this point. They're, they're not being pulled out of the sky. They've gone through a collaborative process already. They represent a consensus of those local areas. And we work very closely with the districts to, to develop this, this priority list here. And, and it does represent a consensus of those communities. Again, they're not projects we're just pulling out of the sky. So does the legislature have to take action before this letter? Go ahead. Um, yes, it does. And actually, if you look in the past with the transportation projects, MnDOT has a pretty good history of developing the consensus that Commissioner Sorrell um, discussed, which is why you don't see um, the uh, um, um, transportation projects spelled out specifically in, in legislation. It's um, usually um, working with their local districts, consulting with legislators. But so we need to appropriate the money. So um, they will have to appropriate this money and then come back and appropriate the Twin Cities money later? They can do it all at once. They can do it all they, at it's once. It's just, you know, they need to grant the authority to spend the money. And tr the tradition in Minnesota is not to have them do it by project. They just do it as a right. block grant of authority. And no problem, you don't see any problem with that happening, right? Well, if they follow the tradition, no. I mean, I, again, uh, in Minnesota, the tradition is they authorize the spending of the money. We have a process that's generally referred to as STIP, or projects are ranked, ordered, in the normal course of events, they go down the list, absent some unusual circumstances, and the stuff in the list gets funded in more or less priority order, with some adjustments for region and geographic balance and other things. Uh, in this case, um, the criteria in the federal law you know, drove the process uh, in addition to what was on the STIP. Governor, so $360 million isn't enough for meritorious highway and road projects statewide. What, what amount would be if you give us to the law? I look at it more as what it is as a percent of the overall bill. So if the bill was approximately $800 billion, and you look at uh, 27 billion being roads and bridges, you know, that's substantially less than 5% of the overall bill. I think a lot of the disappointment for folks, not just me, but around the country was the bill could have been more tightly focused, more tightly targeted on certain things like, and I've said this many times for many weeks, bread and butter infrastructure projects, particularly including roads and bridges. So the relatively small amount of money in the bill for roads and bridges compared to the size of the bill uh, was disappointing. A couple of things. Uh, one is, you know, I think it's important to travel around the state to be in touch with and communicate with people because not everything that happens in the state of Minnesota happens inside the Capitol. Uh, newsflash for Representative Sertich that there is a world beyond the Capitol. And I think the people of Minnesota and the press in greater Minnesota have an expectation and are entitled to hear from the governor and elected officials. Uh, about important announcements, to be able to ask questions and the like, kind of like the DFL uh, budget hearings that you see traveling around the state uh, in a similar vein. But in additionally, uh, these are federal dollars, but the state has the responsibility to select the projects, plan the projects, administer the projects, construct the projects, and be accountable for the results. So communicating to people about the criteria under which these were selected or by which they were selected, the amount of money that's going to be spent, how the money's going to be used, the timeline for development. Those are important issues for people in Minnesota. For example, we were in Mankato today and the city council in St. Peter showed up, or many of them did, about a project that's going right through downtown St. Peter. It's a big opportunity, but it's also a big concern for that uh, community. 
So an, uh, having a chance to convey the criteria why the projects were selected is important. So I understand uh, when you're the majority leader, you are the partisan, you know, uh, jabber, and that's a boxing term, not a talking term. Uh, and so that's his job. But it, it's to suggest that given the state's responsibility and role here that we shouldn't leave the capital to announce this and the criteria and give the greater Minnesota press and the people of Minnesota a chance to hear about it is uh, a little silly. So how are your stance on the federal money? Are you trying to have it both ways by saying you didn't like the bill but you like the money? No, Mary, I think if you go back, I've been very consistent for a very long time saying I supported a stimulus bill, that one would be helpful for the country and for the economy, but that it should be targeted and focused, and I always, or at least frequently, specifically referenced the importance of including bread and butter infrastructure projects like roads and bridges, and suggested that a significant portion of the bill focus on these types of projects. So this is very consistent uh, with the emphasis I placed on the stimulus bill all along. Well, clearly the economy continues to deteriorate, and uh, I don't know that anyone knows for sure when that will end, when it will stabilize, it will, when it will begin to move back in a positive direction. I did have a chance, uh, both here in Minnesota and otherwise, to hear from a lot of economists in the last uh, few weeks. If I were to kind of sum up their consensus, they're predicting continued decline, both in terms of unemployment as well as the economy overall, at least through late 2009 and perhaps into 2010, and then a stabilizing and, and then some growth after that. So short answer to your question is yes, we anticipate uh, increasing unemployment both nationally and in Minnesota for a while with the goal of hoping to get it stabilized and turning back in a better direction. I don't know if it'll hit double digits, but it's clearly going to go up from here. Can you talk a little bit about Well, uh, Tom Hansen is here, and, and uh, we'll have a forecast out, which is the February forecast in early March. It's going to show had continued deterioration in the economy, I and mean, it's obvious that's what's happening here and, and nationally, so the budget deficit is going to get worse. But in the meantime, we've also had this uh, finalization of the federal stimulus bill, so that brings new variables to the table in the form of the federal money, how it will get used, how that fits into the budget. Uh, and so those things will have to be uh, presented as well in the coming weeks. Governor, did you make the formal request for the stimulus money? Uh, no, but I'm going to, and it's just a matter of a simple letter to the... No, for all the reasons you've heard me talk about many times, we're accepting all the money. You know, again, Minnesota is a major net contributor to the federal government. For every dollar we send out, we get 72 cents back. We get the fifth least amount of federal money of any state in the nation. And so we're going to accept our share of the money because we're paying the bill. You know, it's hard to say precisely, Martika, but Tom, you were inching in here. You want to say I, something? Just, yes, um, sir. To Pat's question, the, on the federal stimulus money, the medical assistance, the FMAP money we receive will be reflected in the forecast. The rest of the money will not. We have prior statutory authority to recognize medical assistance money when we receive it from the federal government. So when we issue our forecast on Tuesday, you will see that piece of the federal stimulus directly reflected in our forecast. The rest of the dollars um, will um, have to be incorporated in our budget and won't be reflected specifically in the forecast. How quickly are we likely to see that revised budget? You know, I, I might uh, good-naturedly and jokingly suggest to the legislature we'll produce a second budget if they would produce a first one. but. Uh, all kidding aside, we will uh, have it out as soon as we can, sometime in March. National Transportation, if we may, if I may. How, all these are state projects, right? They're not county or any other local. We want you out on the map. There's a slice of this that is local in nature, but I'll have time to explain okay. that as well. The, the, the projects you hear, see there are state projects. Uh, there may be a local piece included in those projects or a local contribution. Some of them do have... They're, they're collaborative part, projects with our local partners and they contribute a piece. We don't, we're, we're the local projects, uh, we solicited for those and we're in the process of putting that list together as well. How, how much are we talking about the local projects? How much money? It's, 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 it's about $150 million. The, the 
on the list that Brian told. Yeah. yeah. Just to be clear, Tom, yeah. if you look at the bottom of the press release, there's yeah, it's, it's, reference to 596 million. That's the total kind of transportation number, but it includes state, local, transit, and some other stuff. So the road and bridge part of this, the roughly 180 and 180, it's really 172 and 172, so it's 344 for the state and about six or seven million in local match money for that part of it. But in addition, the locals of that 596, they get 30% directly, right? Okay, they get 30% of 502. So there's a chunk of, of money that they get directly for other kinds of projects that are not part of this uh, 180 that we're announcing today. But, but it is part of this 596 or 502 on the bottom of the page. Are you talking about the, the construction, the new construction season? For the state. For the state. Well, to put it in perspective, probably the best way to think about it is uh, th what this represents is a doubling of our federal aid program. And so typically our federal aid program is in the 500 to $600 million range. This represents one year of a federal aid program. So that's a good way to put it in perspective. It's a doubling of the federal aid program for one year. Yep. Right, they are going through the normal bidding process. Well, there's a design, the design build in, uh, is that considered normal? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Governor, are we likely to see any non-road projects looking ahead, any transit, light rail, heavy rail? Yeah, actually, um, the Department of Transportation through Commissioner Sorrell and his team is tasked with uh, uh, assessing the state's rail needs and coming up with a review and assessment of a rail plan and produce a rail plan for Minnesota comprehensively. Well, in, in general, but also it, it will relate to the federal money because a part of that is provides an opportunity to compete for those kinds of dollars or receive those kinds of dollars. But uh, the Department of Transportation is working on a state uh, rail uh, assessment and study that will look at the rail needs and opportunities for the state comprehensively rather than to do it ad hoc and uh, look forward to that report. But clearly what it's going to show is there's some additional opportunity and need for additional rail in Minnesota. And the ones that get talked about a lot are the high-speed passenger rail, but there's other lines uh, as well. Elder, back to the unemployment question. Um, if, if we do hit double digits in Minnesota, are we prepared as a state to deal with that? Yeah, I don't want to suggest that we will. So don't, don't, I'm just said, telling you what some economists have said, either here or nationally. So I, that's not my view or you know, I'm not the one asserting that. But what we do know is that in light of the projected continuing deterioration of the economy that nationally and in Minnesota, unemployment will continue to inch up. Many economists think it'll top out at you know eight, some say nine, some have gone higher. So we really don't know, but it is gonna go up from here. And the best thing we can do for that is to first of all provide relief in the form of our state unemployment insurance benefits, but also do things to try to create an environment here where jobs can grow and will grow so we can get people to have an employment opportunity going forward. Wouldn't that be for a larger bonding bill? A larger bonding bill. Well, if it <coughs> to jobs and we need jobs, does that make the case for going past the traditional 3% and doing a larger bonding yeah, we, bill? I've said, su suggested that we would be open to a bonding bill if that met meeting some of the uh, federal matching requirements or getting some of the other opportunities going relating to the stimulus package. But we have to be careful about how much we put on the state's credit card because, as you know, Pat, we had a traditional limit of 3%. It's up to 3.7, And we've had big bonding bills many of the last, you know, five years. So we haven't had a, you know, a, um, a vacancy in the bonding area. There's been a lot of bonding in the state of Minnesota. And I would also say, as it relates to job creation and job growth, we also have to focus on things that would actually get private sector people to invest in Minnesota. Not everything can be a government building and not everybody can work for the government. We have to have people in the private sector who want to invest here, grow here, uh, build buildings, add employees, buy equipment and those kinds of things. And that's why the uh, Job Recovery Act that I outlined in the state of the state and the budget is important as well. Governor, the director of the FBI says that the Minnesota man may be the first American to become a suicide bomber going overseas, killing 30 people. Have you been briefed on this? Uh, what's your reaction? And well, Homeland Security remains a tremendous concern for the nation and for our state, uh, Pat, and so all of us need to be vigilant in that regard. 
Uh, Minnesota and the country have a lot of concerns about uh, what might happen here in terms of, of terrorism or abroad. And so uh, we have an individual report. I don't know that it's been confirmed yet, but there's a concern about this individual. Um, and more information, I'm sure, will be coming available in the, in the coming weeks. But it does remind us that we need to have a you know, public safety system and an immigration system and a border protection system that is robust and effective. Governor, the uh, coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities is going to be at the Capitol on Friday launching some sort of a statewide campaign to come back to proposed cuts in LGA. Do you want to say anything in your defense that they come up to or criticize them? I do. Uh, first thing I would suggest cities and counties do to save room in their budget is fire their lobbyists uh, to create space in their budget so they can save more uh, police and fire personnel in their cities. The Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities is a big, expensive lobbying organization, and the dues that are going into that organization to pay their lobbyists come from the city's budgets, which then in turn come from the taxpayers. So I would propose that all cities uh, fire their lobbyists and dismantle the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities and put more police and fire on the street. Sounds like yeah, time for question. one last question. Sounds like yeah, a question earlier saying you had specific criticism from Minneapolis, I believe. Do you want to expand upon that and how they've dealt with public safety and financing? Well, just, just this, that the city of Minneapolis has to learn to manage its affairs better without uh, always being bailed out by the federal government or the state. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks.